What's going on guys? Welcome to Titan Town. Tonight we're going to be talking about night two of the NFL Draft. We've been having a lot of fun doing these videos, but some of the other guys had some things come up. So tonight I'm only joined by Ryan Moreland, but maybe they'll jump in at some point during this video. So how you doing, Ryan? I'm doing great, man. And what else do you need? I mean, I, I feel like this wealth of knowledge over here is enough. <laughs> Now, I, mean, I wish that more, uh, more of the guys could have jumped on, and I think they will here in a little bit, but uh, I'm glad to be here. Another exciting night, and we see J-Rob doing what J-Rob does, which is move picks. Exactly. Two rounds with two trades so far. Uh, we ended up getting Harold Landry tonight. And by the way, Ryan is the host of the podcast Two Tone with an E, uncensored. I messed that up somewhere. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure where. <laughs> I think I had the flu or something. You know, you know, when you had the flu, you say, I'm fine. It's too toned. <laughs> 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 but anyways, the Titans got Harold Landry tonight in the second round. Many projected him to go in the first round. A lot of people even projected the Titans to draft him in the first round. How did you feel about the pick, Ryan? All right. I know that, I know that uh, Cody, you're not big. I know Tyler uh, Musson, who we had on last night, and his uh, a TTU regular is not big on Harold Landry. For where we got him, this is a very good pick. I mean, let's talk about the Harold Landry. The man is 6'2", 252 pounds. He's a big guy. He's just short. But the one thing that really makes up uh, for that for him is he has very long arms for his height. So he's still pretty long for uh, for a guy that's that short. Um, and, you know, we talked about Rashawn Evans, our pick last night, as a guy that improved every single year. Now, with Harold Landry, it's definitely a different story because he had a massive junior year and then had a, a kind of a weaker senior year, definitely missed some time. Uh, which had an effect on it, but even if he had missed that time, he was nowhere close to what he was in his junior year. Not a lot of people get scared about that, but we've seen plenty of players come out that had massive junior years, weak senior years, and then went on to be greats. Um, the, the things that I really like about him, you know, he's short, but he, he's still long. He's un incredibly explosive. He's a very explosive player. Um I think he works good in this system. I think he plays best with his hand in the dirt. So I think he works better in a 4-3 system. And I know we're coming from the multiple front here. Um, but I think that we're going to see him a lot with his hand in the dirt. I think that's where he operates the best from. And his speed and explosiveness, I think it's going to give him an advantage over most tackles. The size... It is worrisome for a guy that's going to come off of that that edge. Uh, you know, if he if he puts his hand in the dirt, they two fifty four or two fifty two is not huge for a guy that's going to come off the edge um, coming out of a three stance. But he's a guy that's so explosive that I think that's going to help. Now some drawbacks for Harold Landry, or sorry, yeah, Harold Landry. Okay, uh, get, young. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was my Vince Young impression right there. But he needs more moves. He, he doesn't have a lot as bag of tricks. Really, his, his trick is being more explosive and faster than the guy across from him. So he definitely needs to come up with some more moves. And, and I think we have the coaching staff there and the, the um, veterans there that, that he's going to get help with that. I mean, you're talking about, you know, Derek Morgan, Brian Arakpo, uh, Jarrell Casey, or guys that he's going to be hanging around. I don't think he will have a problem getting to the point where he can develop more. Um, and the other thing, he, he can be very blockable when he goes up against tackles that are long and strong. You know, that becomes an issue because obviously those are two attributes that are really highly regarded at the NFL level is length. And now I'm talking about arm length for those who aren't uh, familiar with what I'm talking about. And then strength and upper body strength. So guys that, you know, get their ass down, um, you know, get good leverage and have the length because in coming off that edge, he can burn guys with short arms, but guys that have long arms are going to be able to get that first punch out there. And if they're strong, they're going to contain Landry. That's the two big things that I've noticed. But where we got him at, a guy that was a projected first rounder uh, and 
I mean, you have to talk about the fact that we gave up a third round to do it. I, I still like the pick. I, I still do. I, I think it was a solid pick. Get another person on this front seven. You can clearly see what Vrabel and, uh, and J-Rob are wanting to do here is, is get a pass rush that is good enough to make this secondary that, you know, I, I'm added more with Malcolm Butler to make them – Unbelievable. Because Logan Ryan, Malcolm Butler, and Adoree Jackson's a really good group. But if you have a solid pass rush, that's a fucking great group. So I think that's where they're going. And I like this pick. You're right. I was a little bit salty after the pick was made. But then I started trying to think positive. I started thinking about how explosive he is off the line. Even if you haven't got a trained eye and you scout players, if you just watch him, you're going to see that explosiveness, that, that explosiveness and that speed off the edge. But then I learned that we traded a third-round pick for him to get him our second and our third, and I was a little bit salty again. But I started trying to think more positive, thinking of more pros, and I calmed down a little bit. But then I remembered that I had said earlier the day before, before the draft even started, that the Titans were either going to pick Rashawn Evans or Sam Hubbard, and I almost was double right because they almost could have had both of them. They actually could have had both of them. So I was a little salty again. Then I was a little salty because some of the players were left on the board. Eugene Nawasi was still there. Somebody that I really, really liked. He was my draft draft crush this year. He went to the Chargers. But I'll give you some more uh, pros besides for his explosiveness. Uh, think about our coaching staff. If there is one position that could benefit from the staff that we got right now, it's the linebackers. Dean Pease, a former linebackers coach, very good. He did some very good things there in Baltimore with some really late round picks, and even some undrafted free agents who was very productive there in Baltimore. Uh, Mike Rabel knows the position well. He coached it. He played it. Now he's a head coach. He's going to get the most out of Harold Landry. And then you got to think about the players that he, that we've already got. You mentioned the defensive players that can mentor him, but he's going to get used to week in and week out going against Jack Conklin and Taylor Lewan, two of the best in the business. So, when he plays against other teams whose offensive line, offensive lines who are not that good, he's already going to have a leg up. So he is a little bit of a project. I definitely think he needs to hit the weight room because that's my biggest knock on him. I didn't see the strength and the power that he's going to need to play in the NFL. But his body type, what his body type reminds me of, is a tad bit smaller than Jadavian Clowney. I think he could play that Jadavian Clowney role in Mike Vrabel's defense, blitz, blitz from either edge. Blitz from a hand in the dirt, blitz from the middle, just blitz from wherever. That's basically all he is right now is a pure pass rusher. Uh, he's not going to give you much in coverage. He's not going to do much against the run, but he can get after quarterbacks, and we've got plenty of guys to do that. And That's another point I was going to bring up about our secondary with Adoree Jackson and Malcolm Butler and Logan Ryan, Kevin Byard. Uh, if we got a good pass rush up front, those guys are going to look phenomenal this season. The only thing I might would worry about a little bit about would be the run game, but this is more turning into a pass-heavy league, so we might match up a little less well against the Jacksonville Jaguars, but Blake Bortles is a bad quarterback, and now he doesn't even have, have as good wide receivers to throw to this year, so we shut down that running game. There's no way the Jaguars are going to beat us. We've been taking a lot of knocks at the Jaguars here lately, but it's fun. <laughs> so, uh, Ryan, what grade would you give them for this pick? Well, first I would uh, say to the Jaguars that, you know, sweep. Um... And another point that you brought up there, uh, you know, you're going out against Taylor Watt and Jack Conklin, but then when you get in the backfield, you have one of the fastest quarterbacks in the NFL that can not only hurt you with his legs, but has that great point guard mentality where he can go out to the edge and then d like just drop one right over your head. So I mean, you have to contend with Marcus Mariota, uh, which is another great point. Uh, for my grade, I'm going to give it a, a, a B plus, which is what I gave Rashawn Evans, but we'll talk in a minute. I upped my grade uh, for Rashawn Evans, um, you know, in the time since last night's show and, and tonight. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but I, I think it's a B plus. This is a guy that had a first round grade on him. He has some development to, uh, to accomplish, but you're getting a guy with a very high ceiling, great burst, great speed. I think he's stronger than people think he is. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good pick. You're, you're, we're really pushing into our front seven, and, and I think it's going to pay off. You know, pass rush was easily the weakest part of our team last year, 
and you're you're really investing in that pass rush. This is a team whose Super Bowl window is opening, and they're addressing the biggest need aggressively. Um, you know, two trades up in a row, two guys are going to play on the front seven. John Robinson's no dummy. He saw the weakness, and he's aggressively attacking that weakness. I, I think it's a great pickup. Right, I agree. I'm not going to give it quite give it a B plus. I'm going to give it a C plus, uh, just for a couple of reasons. I know a lot of people are going to hate me for it, but hear me out. I'm giving him a C plus because he is a bit of a project. Uh, he's not very dimensional. He's one dimensional. He's not very versatile. Um, he's going to need to hit the weight room. So I'm giving it a C plus, but he does have a very high ceiling. Um, and I'm a little bit worried because we haven't got a very good track record with second round picks. Kevin Dodd, and I actually was going to bring him up in a minute. Uh, Justin Hunter, DGB, so I am a little bit worried in that aspect of it, but C-plus because he does have a lot of upside. I'm giving him a C-plus because of who is left on the board, and he's not very versatile. And um, Kevin, this this tells me that Kevin Dodd's time is up in Tennessee. Do you think Kevin Dodd is going to get cut um, after the preseason or into the preseason this year? No, um, I don't. I, I think it's mainly because he's still going to be on that rookie contract. He's still going to be so cheap. So I don't think you'll see him get cut until – I mean, if you still look at it, you know, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit in Rashad Evans because he can play inside or outside, but we're still – we still need depth at outside linebacker. I mean, that that's – you know, we have two guys that are studs in Morgan and Rackbo, but after that it, it gets worrisome. Um, and we're still going to need depth there. We're still going to need people that can come in and make plays. And he's so cheap that I don't think that you're going to see it. And he still has a lot of upside. So I would say probably next year, you know, his performance this year will get him either a contract here or a contract somewhere else, or it'll be his, you know, his last year um, playing regular season football in the NFL. And he might bounce around as a practice player after that. Um, for another year and be gone. But, yeah, just because of how cheap he is, I don't think it'll be his last year. And the upside that he does have, uh, it, it's hard with Kevin Dodd because there's so little publicity around him and, and talk about him that you we truly don't know what is going on. Is it... Um, you know, lingering injury thing, which I think the Titans have tried to sell a little too hard. Uh, is it a mental thing? Is it the talent is just not there? Uh, um, kind of a thing. Because a lot of people made the argument when he came into the draft, it was that he isn't that talented, that he made, you know, had the great season he did his senior year because of the talent around him. Um, you know, and there might be something to that. So is it the fact and it really, to me, comes out of these two. Is he just not that talented? Or is it, uh, you know, he has um, some mental issues that are keeping him from being talented? And, and that's, I, I mean, it's hard. There's just not enough information coming out. And especially since John Robinson got here. And, and we all love J-Rob. But, man, they take that Patriot mentality to heart where it's, you know, it's tight tightly sewn lips no information gets out we talked to uh to jim wyatt regularly and i was talking to jim just the other day and he said and you know i was asking about kevin dodd he said you know as about as much as i do i know man and, you know this guy works for the team and you know he still says he's like this this is a team that you know they when they want you to know something you know it in a second, if they don't want you to know something, you're never going to catch wind of it. And he, and he said that's if you work in the organization or outside of it, and it really has been. And another person um, with ESPN, I believe, just commented this week that out of all the teams that he's ever covered, this team right now with the Tennessee Titans is the most leak-proof that he's ever been around. And, that, and so it's really hard to know what, what's up exactly with Kevin Dodd but, but I think it, it'll last another year because I think the potential is still there. We definitely haven't seen it, but I definitely think it's still there. I think Kevin Dodd still has the ability to be a good football player. And he's really cheap, and that's the big point, is he's really cheap. Um, and, you know, it depends how 
we want to use Evans. And, you know, judging by the talent that we have, the defense that we're moving into, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. And I've, I've, I've teased this a little bit. Uh, oh, but, there, I promise. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think that that's going to leave Kevin Dodd in a good spot, you know, so we'll see, but I really think it'll, it'll last another year uh, just because he's cheap and, and the ceiling is still high. I'm going to take the opposite side of that argument. I'm going to say Kevin Dodd has played his last football game in Tennessee once the preseason comes and cuts start to happen because we're getting Aaron Wallace back who outplayed Kevin Dodd in the preseason last year. He got on the active roster on game day while Kevin Dodd was continuously a healthy scratch there towards the end of the season, week after week. A uh, back injury ended up ending his season short, but he has versatility to play inside or outside just like Evans does. And not only that, Josh Carraway outplayed Evan or outplayed Dodd as well as a seventh round pick. And two seventh round picks, they're going to be cheaper than a second round pick. So Carraway and Wallace are both cheaper than what Kevin Dodd is, and they both outplayed him last season. I just don't think, unless this new scheme that Mike Rabel is going to bring in really plays to Kevin Dodd's strength, I don't see him making the team. Uh, he hasn't done nothing in the league so far except for sack Matthew Stafford, Stafford once. So he hasn't really done anything. I just don't know if he's not catching up on game speed, if the scheme that we was running just wasn't working for him. Because he only had one productive year there at Clemson, and he played with his hand in the dirt that year, and we tried to force him to stand up. So maybe he's just not catching on his own as quickly as he should, but I just don't see him making the team. So um, talking about Evans, you had some new news. You discovered something new about him, or you got a new opinion. You changed your mind. Tell us what it is. Let us let us know. All right. Well, first I want to start off by talking about uh, what you were saying about Aaron Wallace. Um, the thing with Aaron Wallace is Aaron Wallace excels in coverage as an outside linebacker, but he is not a guy that is great at at pressure. And, and he's not a guy that's going to excel in the pass rush, which is really what you want out of an outside linebacker in a 3-4 system. Um, you know, now we're heading to a multiple front. I think you're going to see a lot of different looks. So that definitely, you know, it's still up in the air. And we're not exactly sure how that's going to look. But this brings me to the, the point that you're asking me about, about Rashawn Evans. We're heading to this multiple front. I think you're going to see a push towards a 4-3. Uh, but it's not going to be a 4-3. Uh, but I think you're going to see more of a push towards that 4-3. And I've said it before on, on Two-Tone Uncensored, and you know this, Cody. The difference between a 4-3 and a 3-4 in the NFL at this point is very small. If you run a 4-3, there are 3-4 sets that you run and vice versa. You constantly change up your defense. Most teams run what would be considered five years ago as a multiple front. It's ever-changing. You're trying to get in front of the offense. You're trying to confuse the offense enough that you can succeed because offenses are so... It's, you know, the rules are in their favor. Um, players are getting better, bigger, more athletic, faster. You have to do something. You know, the, the players get better, not only that, but the rules keep siding with the offense. And as a, as a guy that played defense, that fucking sucks. <laughs> but, but you keep seeing it over and over again. Um, so here's my point with Rashawn Evans. When I went back and I was thinking about it is his versatility, obviously, adds uh, another dimension to it. Um, you know, anybody who's versatile, it adds another dimension to what they can do for your team. But his specific versatility, where, you know, it, it's hard to label him as an inside or an outside linebacker. And you saw last night with me and Tyler, if you go back, I think of him more as an outside linebacker, where Tyler thinks of him more as an inside linebacker. And I think that's a lot because of Tyler's thinking more about the need, what we need, which is more of an inside linebacker if we're sticking to a 3-4 system. And I'm thinking more about where he fits. So I'm thinking about systems. And, and then this popped into my mind is you have, let's say, Arakpo and Morgan. Um, and then you have Evans out there in the field. And then you also uh, you also bring out uh, so, so you think about a defensive scheme where we have uh, Arakpo and Morgan on the outside. You have Woodyard and 
uh, and Evans on the inside, this could be a situation and where in which that you put one of those guys on the line, you know, Rackpo or Morgan, you take a defensive lineman out of the play, you add another safety. That's definitely in the realm of, cap- of capabilities. Now, you keep like a standard set with those four, three, you know, down defensive linemen uh, and two guys up, up top. You know, that's definitely something that you could do. Drop, uh, let's say, Derek Morgan out of it. Add another defensive lineman into the situation. Also in the realm of possibilities, this multiple front, in order to have a multiple front, a true multiple front, and have success, you need that player that can do a lot for you. And that pivotal guy, that guy that you can pivot off of. Rashawn Evans is that guy. So not only did we get a guy that I think is very talented, that he can do a lot, I think he's the guy, the cornerstone to this defense working. Because his ability to play inside and outside linebacker, I think is going to set up a lot for us. It's, it's systems that we can bring in three safeties or an extra cornerback or you know pull a down lineman or put another down lineman in. He's going to be the pivot player. We're going to be able to do that because we're going to have faith that he can play on the inside and the outside. If you don't have uh, that ability, if you don't have a guy that has that ability, then you really can't truly play that multiple front. So the more I thought about it last night, and I, and I really, uh, you can go through my notebook right now, I, I drew up schemes and I kept drawing up up last night I'm, I'm i'm hoping i get a call here from dan Pease in a little bit that's our dean Pease from a little bit and be like you know hey ryan what are you looking at because i drew him up last night uh just schemes of how you could line up realistically in the nfl when you have a guy like evans and then i drew them how you would line up if you didn't have evans on the same roster and i i think there's a vast difference i think evans not only is a talented player but i think he opens up our playbook it, like probably times three on, on the defensive side of the football. The way that we can line up has at least doubled, and I think tripled, because of what he brings and the versatility that he brings at, at that inside-outside linebacker position. Brad, I've noticed a lot of five-down five, uh, five, set, five down defensive linemen in Houston schemes. They'll come out with – two defensive tackles, and then have J.J. Watt, Whitney Merciless, and Davian County across the line. I really like that scheme. They'll come in with a single high safety, have the second safety come down and play in the box. I like that scheme, and I hope to see it because uh, not only do we have the pass rushers to do it now, but the Norris seriously, not Norris seriously, <laughs> Jonathan Cyprian, he's more of a run-stuffing safety. He, you don't want him in coverage. Put Kevin Byer back there. Let him run sideline to sideline. And I've also noticed the Baltimore Ravens run that scheme a lot. We got both of those defensive coordinators on our coaching staff now, so I'm hoping to see some more of that from our Titans. Okay, so back on to the Harold Landry topic. This is where we originally started. We kind of got a little bit sidetracked. Now, there are some people saying that Harold Landry is going to be a 10-sack guy right out of the gate. Do you believe he's going to be a 10-sack guy right out of the gate, Ryan? No, I don't. Um and not, and not that I don't think he's talented enough, and I, and I won't say that, because I do. I do think that he is talented enough to be a 10-sack guy. Uh, but when you look at this defense and where it's at right now, I mean, you're talking about Aragpo and Morgan, uh, Jarrell Casey, Evans now, who I think will play inside and outside like we just talked about. Um and, and then I think Landry would come after that. And then right after him, you could you could start talking about Cersei, who was a guy that was a weapon in the pass rush quite a few times last year. Adoree Jackson with his speed, also a weapon in the pass rush whenever we use him. If Harold Landry gets 10 sacks it's, uh, next year, it's one of two situations. Harold Landry is J.J. Watt, and we didn't know it. <laughs> you know, he's... He's just a premium uh, defensive end, and, and nobody caught it but us. Or 
we have like four guys, five guys on our roster that have ten sacks. And I, as much as we would love that to have a team that gets close to eighty sacks, you know, it, it's not going to happen. That's not that's not realistic. I, I I think that a realistic number for for Landry, given who we have left, you know, that we brought over from last year and the talent that we have, I think a realistic number and a good number is four and a half. And yet that's – given the fact that Landry's not going to start. Landry's not going to be a guy that starts very often this year. You know, unless there's a major injury, Landry in his first year is going to be a rotational player. Um, and, you know, that's a good thing for us. It just shows you the depth that we have there at the pass rush. And, and this just gives us another guy. Um, uh, you know, Rekko and Morgan, excellent pass rushers. And I don't. I think that Landry best fits with his hand in the dirt. So I do think he'll get some time standing up and um, and then coming off of the edge. But I still don't think you see him as a mainstay starter. I think he's a guy that's gonna another guy that kind of helps you out in that. Um, not as much as Evans, but helps you out in that multiple front where you can play him standing up or you could put him on the line opposite. You know, Jarrell Casey obviously and rush him from the end. So it's, I think picking guys purposely that not only are on the front seven, but help us with this multiple front with that versatility. But I don't think he's a guy that's going to start. He'll start maybe a few games, but he's not going to play enough downs to realistically be a 10-sack guy. Um, he's just not. I, I really think he'll have a good year. I, I'm not nearly as harsh on Landry as Cody and Tyler have been. Um, but I, I realistically, 10 sacks, if he gets 10 sacks, then I think Rackpo and Morgan are both over 15. <laughs> and if we have that kind of season, like, like fuck yeah, let's do it. But but realistically, no, that won't happen. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Three to four sacks is about what I feel like he could get because he's going to be playing as a rotational piece. He's not going to be a full-time starter. Um, I think if he does get 10, it's because a lot of the time somebody else is chasing the quarterback into his lap. And like I said, because of the power, I just don't see the power needed for the NFL. Even though he's 250 pounds, he just looks so small to me. And I, I kind of disagree with you there. I think he would be a better standing up outside linebacker because of his um, size. I don't think he'd do as good with a hand in the dirt. I think he needs to get that first step, first step head start against the opposing offensive tackle. So... I'm just going to say it now. I've, I've been really harsh on him. I do admit it because he is one-dimensional. If he gets 10 sacks, I'll shave my head. It's a good thing, too, because the season ends in wintertime. And um, that's a punishment for me because I'm Irish. Summertime, I would be so bad sunburned. I'd have blisters on top of my head. <laughs> oh, I'm excited now. I'm hoping Landry gets 10 sacks now. Um, oh, man, I'm, ex- I'm tweeting that. Like, I'm, I'm excited now. I'm, I'm excited. I'm pumped now. No, don't worry. Uh, I'll do it. It's a definite that. Uh, oh, I know you're. I, I feel like you're a man of your word. I know you'll do it. I'm just excited to see it happen. <laughs> but my point with him and his hand in his dirt is, if you watch his tape, he plays much better with his hand in the dirt. And I know he's undersized, but his first step, he does. He does this weird thing with his upper body. And you watch it, where he shoulders in, but his step is out. So he gets tackles to hesitate with the top half of his body, but the bottom half of his body is stepping outward. Um, so that first step, not only is it explosive, but it also gets the, the tackle to freeze for a second, and that's all he needs to get by him. So he's much better on his, on his tape. You watch his hand on the dirt much better than him standing up. That's why, and it's definitely not the size, because he's not a big guy. Um, well, you know, as we say that, he, he's as big as me and Cody put together, but not a big guy NFL-wise. Um, but he's so good off of when he has his hand in the dirt. And that's definitely where his uh, his ability really shines. So I, I definitely agree with you. He's not a guy that you want to put over there often because, you know, the size it will definitely play a factor. But I think he's a guy that's sneaky and bursteful enough that if you put his hand in the dirt, he's going to make some tackles look stupid coming off of the edge. Especially when we play teams 
that have bad uh, tackles, and that comes to mind. The first team that comes to mind is the Texans. Second team, the Colts. That and you know if the the Jags don't fix it on the right side, the Jaguars, you know, I have an issue at, at the right tackle position where this is a guy that <laughs> could really burst off of the edge and make some tackles that are a little short and don't have the best footwork and make them look stupid coming off that side. All of our division rivals have a problem on the right side of their line. And the Houston Texans have a problem on both sides of their line. Uh, so I think he's a guy that you really can blitz off that edge. I, I would expect, I'll say this, I think Harold Landry, I, I would say he gets most of his sacks in divisional games. I'll say that right now. I think it'll be true because of the tackle presence in divisional games is not good. Now when we go up against teams like the Cowboys that we have to play, you have a great offensive line, even though everything else seems to not be working. They do have a great offensive line still. Um, he's not going to get sacks in that game. But, yeah, unless you get, like Cody was saying earlier, someone gets pushed into him. Uh, but in divisional games, I think he will get a sack or two, maybe three, coming off of that right edge. Because he has that speed and that quickness and something that, it's going to benefit him in the divisional uh, in the divisional games. And real quick, it's a credit to Jay Rob. His versatility is obviously fantastic. His ability for where we got him is fantastic. But they always say you draft to win your division. And we drafted a guy that's going to be really good against right tackles. I'm happy you brought up division games because I wanted to bring that up and I almost forgot about it. The Indianapolis Colts, they've been taking a very similar approach to what we've taken in the past in this draft. All they've drafted is offensive line and front seven guys. So what makes me think these games are fixing to turn into, it's going to be a physical shootout. Normally when you have really physical football games, it's because when both teams are just pounding the rock, running into each other, and they're really low scoring. But this is supposed to be a physical game up front with a good air attack, good running game. Andrew Luck versus Marcus Mariota. Two really good front sevens versus two really good offensive lines. Maybe not this year, but in the coming years with Quentin Nelson, uh, Bray, Bray, Braden, Braden Smith from Auburn. Um, that's who they picked up. They picked up a couple of front seven guys, too. What do you think about the future of us going up against the Colts? Does it take you back to the 90s when we had Steve McNair and Peyton Manning? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start by saying I definitely don't think it's going to be this year, like you said, but in years to come, it definitely could be. I, I had Quentin Nelson for everybody that was, that listened uh, to TTU. I think he's the best player in the draft, bar none. For his position, he's the best player in the draft. I think this guy is going to be a – he's the first guy I've ever said this about. He's going to put on a gold jacket, and it's the only time and the first time I've ever said that about a rookie coming in the league. I – Watching his tape is just watching a man embarrass other men. Like, that, that's his whole tape. Um, now, saying that, it will be a couple of years before we really see this happen. But I think a better analogy uh, than the, the uh, Steve McNair and uh, Peyton Manning era would be a couple of years ago, you know, five, six years ago, when we saw the emergence of Russell Wilson and Colin Kaepernick. Because you saw two teams that really could move the ball and spread it around with two smart quarterbacks. But you also saw, even though they, they were, you know, tended to be higher scoring games sometimes, and they were hard hitting. You saw guys like Cam Chancellor out there and Navarro Bowman, the guys that could really light someone up. And that's what I think it's going to be like when, if, if, our draft picks pan out, and really, if, if the coach draft picks pan out, I think that's the game you're going to see. You're going to see those big plays because we have the talent to do that. Obviously, if Andrew Luck's on the field, they have the talent to do that. As much as we hate to admit that, I mean, that's true. That's what I think it's going to be. Is you're going to see huge hits and big plays. I, and, you know, some at that point in time, and I still think to this day, some of the most exciting games in football – you saw when Colin Kaepernick and the 49ers and their peak went up against the Seattle Seahawks and Russell Wilson. 
It was big plays and monster hits. Uh, and I think that that's what you're going to end up getting. If, if these draft picks pan out, I, that's what I think you're going to get, which is exciting. Yeah, and then you look at the rest of the division, too. The Jaguars, they have that Super Bowl caliber defense. They got Leonard Fournette, but they still got Blake Bortles as their, as their quarterback. They lost some really good weapons in their receiving court. And um, they got – did I mention Leonard Fournette? I think I did. They got Leonard Fournette as a running back. Their offensive line, they need to work on that. They need to get a new quarterback and some new receiving courts. But that defense is really good. Then you look at the Houston Texans. They got Deshaun Watson with all of his weapons. On the other side of the ball, they got J.J. Watt, Whitney Merchless, Jadavian Clowney, uh, Zach Cunningham. Can't remember the other guy's name right off the top of my head. And they're addressing that secondary. They drafted Justin Reed tonight. Uh, they got a very physical defense and a high-powered offense. So uh, these division games, they're going to be really fun to watch, I think. The Houston Texans and the Jacksonville Jaguars, I still think they have some stuff to clean up, as well as the uh, Indianapolis Colts. But here in the future, this could be a division that's up for grabs and has four Super Bowl contenders right there in the one division together. Here, I'll say this right now. Hold on, I'm like Ian Rappaport over here. Like the, <laughs> I said it last night. Like the poor drug man's Ian Rappaport. Everybody's texting me right now about the draft. I, I think this is a, a truth. I think the Colts in the next two seasons pass the the Texans. I think the Texans will be the basement of the league. Uh, at least for a year or two in the next couple of years. Deshaun Watson had an impressive showing um, early in his career. He threw a lot of interceptions early in his career. I think teams are going to figure out where he likes to throw and what he likes to do, and he's going to adapt from there. He's not a guy that's really known well for adapting. He's not a guy that's a, a smart quarterback. Um, and, he, you know, I'm not saying he was in college, but at the NFL level, he's not a guy that you would consider a smart quarterback. He's going to struggle. The Colts are, trying, are finally figuring out how to draft, which helps them out a lot. But they're also figuring out how to manage value. I, I think the Colts, maybe not this year, uh, but the year following, will jump Houston. And I think, obviously, the Jaguars are, you know, the team that are, is going to compete with the Tennessee Titans for the title for the next few years. The thing is, is I, if I'm Jacksonville, I don't draft the defensive player at all. And they did. I, they took Taven Bryan in round one. Right? In the first round. I, I don't touch a defensive player. Uh, unless it's too good to pass up and, like, let's not pretend. Hey, Sorry, Taven Bryan's a great player, but let's not pretend that, and with a very high ceiling, I might add, but let's not pretend that he was the best player on the board. Like, he wasn't. You know, you're talking about so many receivers were on the board at this point. Why don't you go after one of those receivers? Why, like, when a team that's so needy at that position, why don't you do that? Why don't you try to bring in a guy that's going to compete with Blake Bortles? After how bad he's been, why don't you do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. This is a, the best defense in the league last year. And I understand that you still need a draft to keep it the best defense in the league. You know, we saw what happened to the Broncos when they kept trying to plug guys in the offense and they ignored the defense and look what happened. But you have to get guys. Your Super Bowl window is opening. You have to get guys that are going to get you there. And they don't. They don't have it on offense. The Titans swept them last year. I think the Titans will sweep them this year again. All right. Yeah, I think Taven Bryan could have started in a lot of defenses, but he won't start there on the Jacksonville Jaguars defense. And as far as um, Deshaun Watson goes, I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but he is a scrambling quarterback, and a lot of scrambling quarterbacks have trouble staying healthy, and so far he hasn't done that. And a lot of times you're never the same after an ACL injury. So um, let's go ahead and talk about the future of the draft. It's almost over. We got rounds four through seven coming tomorrow. Currently the Titans have a fifth-round pick and two sixth-round picks left. What position do you think they should address with those picks, and is there a certain player you think they should target in the remaining rounds? I, I think that um, guard is obviously a position they could address. Uh, safety still stands, you know, especially the free safety, or sorry, strong safety position as a safety, as a position they could address. Wide receiver is still, like, maybe, but I, I really don't think that uh, we will at this point. 
and, and you know, it, it's it's incredibly hard to tell. So far, we've had two picks, two trades. I mean, we're we're dead even with picks and trades, and so it's so hard to tell what John Robinson will do. But one guy, and I'm I'm gonna be a homer here for once on here. You know, Tyler's normally the guy that, that gives you all the Ohio <laughs> State guys. I'm gonna be a little bit of a homer here. That's not uh, what Tyler is. He's not, he might be mad because Sam Hubbard fell to the third round. <laughs> That's where he is. He's, he's pouting somewhere right now. Uh, no, but Kaiser White is the guy that I think is going to be a great pickup. Um, plays safety for West Virginia. He's a guy that's a hell of a tackle. Hell of a tackler. I think he's going to be almost. I don't. I won't say as good, but almost as good as Cyprian. He's going to be much better in coverage. I, I think he does both of them very well without being great at either. So he's not going to be a guy that's going to like dominate. He's not going to be a Kevin Byard, but he's also not going to be like an Ed Reed that's like a pickup truck at, you know, 220 pounds or 205 pounds. He's not going to be that guy. But he is pretty good at both, of, uh, you know, in coverage and, and as a hitter. I think it's a guy that the Titans could use, a guy that they have a little bit more versatility with, especially in a multiple front. That's what we've been talking about. Kaiser's a guy that could help you out with that, give you a little bit more versatility to what you can do. And it's, I think it's obvious by who we've drafted so far that that's what we're looking to do is add more mysteriousness and more wrinkles to this defense to make it better. You know, I've talked about it with Rashawn Evans, his ability to play inside and outside linebacker, with Harold Landry, his ability to play uh, with his hand in the dirt and standing up. Kai's usually the guy that's going to add another wrinkle where he can, he's good enough in coverage where he's not a liability, and he's good enough in the box that he's not a, li- not a liability. Because right now we have Cyprian, who's fantastic in the box. He's a great tackler. He, he's a huge asset in the running game, but he's a liability in coverage. Kaiser's the guy that can I, – I don't think you want him to start necessarily, or at least early in his career, but he's a guy that you would want um, – to play in rotation, and because you don't know what you're going to do with him. And that's the biggest thing on defenses right now is all you can do is try to confuse the offense because the rules are so skewed in the offense's favor. All you can do is try to confuse them. Kaiser's the guy that can really help you do that. So that's the guy that I really like. I think guard, safety, wide receiver, um, definitely defensive tackle and, and nose tackle. Are positions that we could definitely add some depth to. Depth to, I still don't think outside linebackers out of the question as well. Yeah, I think you hit the note, the nail on the head there, talking about safeties and wide receivers. In the press conference after the Harold Landry pick was made, they talked to John Robinson and Mike Vrabel about the trade and how few picks we have left, only having a fifth and a sixth round left. And John Robinson responded with, they were specifically asked about depth at the safety and wide receiver position because we don't have a lot. And he said he felt like there was players that are going to be here later in the draft that he could pick up. And I'm going to quote Carlton Davis from Madden. I play Madden. Uh, Carlton Davis is actually one of the commentators tonight on NFL Network where I'm watching the draft. And he says on Madden that speed kills and he can do it in a number of different ways. And there's this old draft strategy that goes way back. I don't know how far back, but you pick your stars in the first round. You pick your roster in the second and mid rounds. And then... At the end of the draft, you find speedy guys who can get to the ball quickly, who can make a lot of big plays for you. And wide receiver and the safety position are two positions that really use speed. As for a specific name, uh, I'll throw ahead. I'll go ahead and throw out Debo Samuel from South Carolina. He's a possession receiver with some speed. He's got some deceptionist with his routes. He's very deceptive, and as if we need it, he can help in the return game. We've already got a Dory Jackson and and Deion Lewis, who can do that for us. But he can also contribute there. If, you know, you don't want to risk the other guy's health or if the other guy goes down. He'll provide some solid depth. But I could also look at running back because you don't want to have David Flewellen as your third back for forever. Someone like John Kelly out of Tennessee. Uh, nose tackle, defensive tackle. I think we could use a little bit more depth there. But we also got some undrafted free agents to look forward to. Antoine Woods is about to crack the starting lineup, I believe, this year. Possibly. If not, he's going to have a heavy rotation anyway, but he was an undrafted guy who's been making a lot of noise and outplayed Sylvester Williams last year. 
100% agree with that. I think Woods, you see on the field this year, um, he, he's a guy that, you know, came in undrafted but was the highest rated undrafted player in that draft class um, almost unanimously. I think you see him crack that lineup this year. Sebastian Williams, I hated that pick when we pick him up. He, he's a guy that has never lived up to what he what he should have been. Um, and I think that Sebastian Williams has, or sorry, I, I think that uh, Antoine Woods has been a guy that has impressed. He's he's not a do it all kind of guy at nose tackle, but he's a guy that does a couple things well enough that he's not a glaring issue. Williams was an issue. Uh, for us, and and obviously, you know, we we talk dollars and cents. It's a business at the end of the day. Uh, he's a guy that's very cheap right now. Yeah, fun fact: I play Xbox with Antoine Wood, so I just want to throw that in there. I like to brag a little bit, but he's an awesome dude. Like when he we play PUBG, when he'd die, he'd sit there and spectate and tell us when somebody's coming out the corner. You know, he'd share his items with you if you picked up a lot of extra items. He, he just seems like a real blue-collar guy. I'm hoping we can get him on the channel or your podcast sometime and talk to him. Right now is a little bit of a bad time with the season just picking up, so I haven't talked to him in probably two or three weeks now, so hopefully I'll get to talk to him soon. I think Taylor got his picture taken with him. He was there at the uh, Nissan Stadium draft party that Justin was at last night as well. So in, in PUBG, who is the better player? Is it Cody Milholen? Or is it Antoine Woods? I'm going to say it's Antoine Woods because uh, I'm terrible. <laughs> I'm not very good at video games. I didn't start playing video games till shoot, I was probably 14 or 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. Heard here first, Antoine Woods, better at video games than Cody Milholland. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. In the description box below, you'll find links to find Ryan's podcast, his Facebook page, his Twitter, all that good stuff. Check him out. A lot of good content on his channel and his podcast, wherever you want to call it. But um, God bless. Tighten up. You got anything you want to add, Ryan? Uh, yeah, real quick. Uh, I have a Patreon account. If you go on and search that, Patreon slash uh, TTU. You want to give a little bit of money towards the show. Uh, we're doing that. And then a new sponsor that I'd like to pimp, if that's okay, Tyler. And I'm drinking it tonight. Great Lakes Brewing. It's some of my favorite beer, and they've been sending me some free shit, so I've been drinking it, and it is <laughs> fantastic. So definitely check it out if you live in, like, the Ohio, uh, Michigan, Pennsylvania. I think they even go down as far as Tennessee. Definitely check it out. It's great beers, uh, and not very expensive. It's like a buck more than, like, uh, than uh, like you know, your Bud Lights and your Cords Lights, and it's way better. So definitely check that out. I don't drink, but if I did, I definitely would. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> that might be my favorite quote ever. I don't drink, but if I did, I definitely would. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, guys, comment and let us know what you thought about the Harold Landry pick, how you think the Titans' defensive scheme is going to look. Just answer all the questions we answered tonight because we want to hear back from you. We want to know what you're thinking. Let us know players that you think we should target coming up here in the fourth, fifth, and sixth rounds if you think we're going to trade or whatnot. But anyways, guys, thanks for watching. We've had a lot of fun doing this video series. I felt like I was bothering people when I reached out to ask, you know, but uh, we've had a lot of fun. Everybody jumped on board. It's just been a real big time. It's just too bad that people were busy tonight and couldn't hop on with us. Uh, Justin had to work. Uh, Tyler's MIA. Haven't heard or seen from him, which is really rare. He's usually raring to go, and... Uh, Chris got stuck with his wife, so <laughs> we just had a good time without him. Happens to the best of us. <laughs> All right, guys, take it easy, and we'll see you next time.